course, everybody's entitled to speak on what the movement is. It's all about. Uh, no one person can sum up what it's all about. But uh, Albert Brown was nice enough to agree to be uh, someone to start us off. John Washington did too, but I hopefully he'll be back in a minute. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Albert to uh, just start us off. We're hoping to discuss a little bit of the, the issues that went on in the play, how those connect to the issues of the movement today, and really we're going to see the discussion go on to whatever we want to make it be. So uh, Albert, would you start us off? Sure. I mean, I think it's I think it's great that uh, so many people from Occupy came down. Uh -huh. And, uh, and so I won't talk too much, but I just want to kind of kind of briefly talk about my um, my view of the play. I found it very interesting that, in my view, the animals represented kind of the 99%, you know, the people who were oppressed and trying to figure out their lives underneath the oppression. And the human beings kind of represented the 1% to me, uh, you know, always trying to manage, you know, the oppressed, the exploited. And um, I found it interesting that uh, whoever wrote the play, which I'm not sure who, who, who I mean, uh, besides the original yeah, people who wrote the screenplay. Justin play, Karcher yeah. was her here. I guess he, hopefully he'll be back. He told me Because I, I have a question for him, because it's interesting, because I, I found it interesting that at the end, you know, the basic theme was love and anger. You know, heart, heart, love, and anger. You know, rebellion and love, and how those two can be treacherous yeah. within you know, an organizing intent for change. So I found it very interesting that, that love and anger became both the, um, the impetus for the transformation, for the revolution, but also the demise of it. And, uh, and, I, and I find that very interesting because I think in a very real sense, in, in Occupy Buffalo, there is that sense. There, there's, there's factionalization, there's, there's passion, there's anger, there's, there's constant kind of like, uh, moving parts going on politically inside and outside, and so I, I think that uh, you know you could speak about any of that, but I just found it interesting in play. So maybe we'll just kind of open it up. Yeah, yeah. Is there anybody who's trying to to uh, take the ball from there as far as what uh, what they saw in the play, how that connects to them, for what uh, what they see is going on in the world today? Well, I actually I want to go on what Albert just said there about the. Um, the whole love and anger thing, I thought that was really, really moving. Um, because I think it's a very interesting concept, but it doesn't have to be the case. It doesn't have to be an anger. Um, there doesn't have to be anything to destroy us. And I really think that it's great that um, this was displayed to us, right? Like at such a crucial time where, you know, tensions are really high, there's a lot of budding heads, and it's all really about, you know, the eternal anger when it doesn't need to be that way, you just need to remember that you can survive in love. And um, I don't know, I thought it was really cool because I honestly, I've never read the play um, or read the book. Wasn't even planning on coming here today. Jamie was just like, hey, this is happening. Let's do it. I was like, okay, great. And it was such a beautiful thing. And I also just want to say thanks for opening this up. Well, um, yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, the, uh, the people said to me, oh, well, did you did you know that this big movement was going to happen and that's why you chose to do Animal Farm at the time? No, obviously, we didn't know that that, uh, that this big movement was going to explode, but all the stuff we do here at Subversive Theater is about these sort of issues, so it's no coincidence that it came up. Um, we've, we have a little tagline, our tagline's been Subversive Theater, where the center takes center stage. Uh, which I've always been proud of, but recently changed the tagline on the web website to be uh, theater for the 99% to, uh, to fit into what's, uh, what's going on in the streets. Uh, but I did want to ask what I just brought up. Is there anybody out there who has read the book uh, that, that this is all about? Okay, some people have. So I'm just curious if anybody wants to talk about what they saw. I mean, well, you, know, you never know in our society how many people really read books that want. But yeah, yeah, what do they think of the book versus the play? The original intent, I think, of Orwell was to just show communism in a way that, you know, you took out the pig capitalism and replaced it with a new form of communism, but you still ended up with a pig, whether it was Jones or the pig. So one of the things is, is that in, you know, in this movement, I mean, we really haven't identified what it is at the end is the intent. And that's something that we need to come together on and people can realize that none of the systems that we've had in the past have ever worked. So 
the reform that we're trying to you know, go towards, I mean, eventually we'll embrace some type of reform, but the reform will only be a patch that satisfies us for a period of time, and maybe our children will have to, you know, our, our, our children's children might have to go through the same type of thing. And what I want is a transformation to us to realize that each of us has its, our own power to change the things around him or her so that it's not government that we need, but ourselves to govern. Yeah, John. <laughs> Which I think is a really good point. Um, and I am just eager for people who are familiar with the book. I uh, just wonder if anybody else has any thoughts about the, the contrast between the book and the play, or whether you felt it was uh, stuck true to what the book was about, whether it, whether it changed any of that. I was really happy with the, uh, the very end of the play, Stuck Tree to Orwell's original vision for the last scene in the book, where, uh, I mean, obviously, at the end of the book, it's just the narrator that's saying, and you couldn't tell the difference between the text and the uh, But I'm glad that in the play adaptation, that held true. What I think the play did differently than the book is the play really showed um, the mundaneness of uh, an occupation. And actually, the difference between the ideology and the everyday, okay, how are we going to fill 24 hours for everyone? <laughs> um, and I think, you know, obviously that wasn't uh, Orwell's prerogative when he was writing it, but it's interesting as the adaptation was able to pull out from the dames and everyday life. I saw a big reaction to that. Anybody else, anybody else want to speak to that uh, connects? Well, I mean, it's just, like, it was funny, because, like, today, you're walking around, and it's cold. Nobody wants to stand out on the streets, but, like, you can't just sit around and feel like you're not doing anything. And it's, it is funny, like, I didn't really realize that's what was going on until you just said that. But that's what it was, like, oh, you know, all these little side conversations between Boxer and Molly, you know, and that's really what's going on, is just, like, there really is a lot of milling around and just discussing and that's why I don't really like, I, I never really look like it as people wasting time, because at least they're talking. And um, I thought it was really cool though that you just brought that up. But um, like, yeah, there is a lot of just like, hmm, well now what? Like we're in the middle of a revolution and you know, stuff is going on all around us, but like, here we are in this dome, literally. Like, <laughs> you know, right. Just gotta keep making stuff happen. Um, something I found interesting um, about this play is that uh, how it really highlighted um, <coughs> patterns that become habitualized in oppressed communities. Um, when you're living under oppression for a long time, you really naturalize habits. Um, like this one, like the workhorse and Molly. The workhorse is like, we have these values. Like I'm, I work hard, I work hard, I work hard, I work hard for someone else. And just to make things better, I will continue to work harder. And, and Molly with her, um, you know, vanity and narcissism and, and um, kind of like more consumerist mentality. And uh, what, you know, has historically, um, what has happened in a lot of communities where a regime has left is that you're still left with a population of people still behaving oppressed because they don't know how to, or they have no awareness that there is a need to like, Un, to like shed those behaviors that are keeping them down, and and that also sets up a climate for you know another group to come in and continue to exploit because it's a, it's a pattern of comfort, and it's um, a very natural way of being that becomes deeply ingrained. So um, you know in this play it really sets up the climate for you know the pigs to come in and, and take on a very natural role of leadership, um, and, and so I think one of the things that are facing Occupy right now is how do you do that internal work, how do you address your own ways in which you are oppressed and you are um, you know, contributing to a system of oppression and work through that so then you can at least have um, a good starting ground to build a different paradigm that is healthier <coughs> and transformative. I think it was Harriet Tubman who said, uh, she was asking him uh, you know, towards the end of her life, like aren't you are you happy that, um, I think it was here at Turner, are you happy that you've, you've freed so many slaves? 
And she said, I could have freed so many thousands more if they only realized they were slaves. Mm -hmm. and, and